Hey everybody, Charles for HumbleMechanic.com back to take your questions on intake manifolds, water pumps, check engine lights, and more. This is episode 94 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. So if you have a question for a show like this, the way to get it answered is to shoot me an email, charles at humblemechanic.com, and put question for Charles in the subject. And really, if you would put the question at the top and then space down a couple of rows and then give me more details, that'll help me filter through the emails and do a better job of answering more questions. All right, before we get into the show, let's talk about the sponsor of the day, which is CRP Automotive. CRP deals in a ton of OE replacement and maintenance parts. They have everything from timing belts to suspension parts and cooling system parts. They're even the supplier of Volkswagen and Audi factory DSG fluids. So check them out at crpautomotive.com. And as always, I'll be sure to put links in the video notes. Really quick, before I get into your questions, I had the pleasure on Saturday of flying down to Atlanta for the very first Treffen South Volkswagen Audi Porsche show. The show was held at the Atlanta Motor Speedway, and I gotta say it was an incredibly awesome car show. The guys that put it together did an amazing job of keeping the car show exactly how they wanted it, Plus it was cool because we got to drive on the Atlanta Motor Speedway. It made me really wish that I had my car there. But I'll have a video coming out later this week that you can check out all about the show. Just wanted to throw Kip and the boys a quick shout out and say, great job guys. Okay, let's get into your questions. First one didn't give me their name, but it says, hey, my intake manifold runner recently failed on me. It had blown holes through it while I was driving. I replaced the manifold with the new one as well as the gasket, but I'm still having a misfire in cylinder one in a random misfire code. Could this be caused by carbon buildup? So great question. Odds are that carbon buildup is not the cause of the misfire and failing intake manifold. I've never actually seen one of these intake manifolds fail in a way that blew holes in it, but I have heard of it and I have seen pictures of this. Typically what has happened is an injector failed where it's just dumping fuel straight into the cylinder and basically causing a backfire and breaking the intake manifold. If you're having a consistent misfire on only one cylinder, you definitely want to take a look at what's going on. Take the ignition coil out, take the spark plug out, and see if the cylinder is full of fuel. Take a look at the spark plug, see if it's saturated in fuel. You'll be able to smell it right away. If nothing has evidence of fuel saturation, swap the coil and spark plug to another cylinder and see if the misfire moves. That's the fastest way to start to diagnose misfires. You may have carbon buildup on this vehicle, but typically just straight carbon buildup does not cause a consistent misfire. The most common thing that carbon buildup will cause is a misfire on cold start, which means the vehicle has sat for an extended period of time, and when you first start it up, you'll get either a flashing check engine light, or the car will run really rough, or maybe even both. Or I have also seen it where it's just a straight check engine light. I wouldn't be driving this car too much without diagnosing this misfire problem. You don't want to create any more issues. You don't want to have another intake manifold explosion. And uh, you surely don't want to keep saturating that cylinder with fuel, which it kind of sounds like that may be what's happening. So great question. Let us know what the source of the misfire was. All right, next one comes from Ben. He says, awesome videos, keep them up. What was the long Torx tool you are using with the blue handle? So in the DIY video that I did on the 2.5 liter vacuum pump, I had a blue handled bit driver with a long T30 and a T25 Torx bit. The bits are basically just quarter inch drive bits, the extended ones that were about six inches. The driver is actually a blue point bit driver. And it came as a kit, there's three. There's one that's straight, there's one that's bent in, and there's one that's bent out like this. It's an awesome, awesome, awesome little bit driver set. It was about 60 bucks for the three drivers as well as a few bits. And I gotta say, it's well worth the money. I don't know how many teeth these drivers had because, well, it doesn't say on the Snap-on website, but it's a very fine tooth and you can get a pretty good amount of movement in a small space. I really recommend these bit drivers. They're nice, they're small, they get into very tight places, and I use them all the time. The, uh, the model number is BTWSMPK. That's for the three-piece set. You can buy them individually, but I think the 60 bucks is well worth it. I'll put a link in the video notes for you guys right to the Snap-on page if you want to check them out. I forget where the extended bits came from. I probably bought them on eBay or Amazon or something like that. If I can find them on Amazon, I'll put a link to that as well. So awesome question, Ben, and I highly recommend those small bit driver ratchets. There are other companies that do make those. I think I bought some Craftsman ones initially, and I hated them. The little... Um, the little switch would get turned so you'd be ratcheting one way and just hit it the wrong way and then it would start ratcheting the other way, which is really, really annoying. 
Uh, so make sure you get these or ones that have an equivalent design. There are some that look very similar, but just don't perform the way these blue point ones do. All right, next one comes from Brendan. He says, I was on a small road trip from Roanoke to Richmond when my check engine light came on on my Mark VI GTI. I had the P2015 intake manifold flat position sensor, implausible signal fault. I've just crested the 70K mark and purchased the extended warranty through CarMax at the time of purchase. I know a bunch of people that had the same issue and had the dealer replace the intake manifold under warranty. Will I fall into the category with my CarMax warranty or will I be out of pocket for this? Thanks for your help and I look forward to hearing from you. Also, will I damage anything driving the car back from Richmond to Roanoke about 180 miles to get it fixed or do I need to look at this while I'm here in town? Thanks again, Brendan. Couple of really good questions. So. There was a warranty extension on a lot of the CCTA 2.0T, uh, the TSI engines, and what we have to look at is whether your specific vehicle was covered or not. The way to know that is by the VIN. So if you're at the dealer, they can run the VIN and check to see if your vehicle falls under the warranty extension. If you're not at the dealer, get your VIN call your local dealership and ask them to check for you. And they can let you know whether it's covered. They'll tell you the mileage that it's covered to, which I wanna say is 120. They'll also tell you the date in which that warranty expires. The only way to know 100% for sure if your vehicle has the warranty extension again, call your local dealership. Now, whether or not it will fall under the CarMax warranty or the Volkswagen warranty really depends. Let's say you're covered under both. The dealership's probably just gonna cover it through the Volkswagen warranty extension because it's easier. No phone calls to make, no authorizations to get, and the warranty company through CarMax probably knows there's a warranty extension on that intake manifold. So they're going to default to the Volkswagen warranty. Hopefully, if you're not under the warranty extension, your CarMax warranty will cover it. I gotta say the CarMax warranty is one of the better warranties out there. I've had very, very few issues with covered items under the CarMax warranty. Now there are some things that aren't covered really under any extended warranty, things like seat belts and airbags, maintenance parts, wear and tear parts, but the CarMax one is one of the better ones out there. So Brendan, the only way again to know 100% for sure is to have the dealership run your VIN and check to see if you're covered. If you're not covered, then they would call the CarMax warranty company and see if they'll authorize that repair. As far as driving it with the P2015, it really depends. If it's just an intake manifold position sensor fault, you'll probably be okay. If it's one of the failures where the arm pops out of the intake manifold, that can cause drivability concerns that'll definitely decrease your fuel economy. And while it probably wouldn't leave you stranded, it may make the drive home a little bit more difficult. So I would at least get it checked out before you head back. Then based on the severity of the failure, make your decision from there. Typically, if you can avoid it, you don't wanna let a check engine light go on for too long. But as far as whether to get it fixed now or wait till you get back home, it really depends again on the severity of that failure. So great question, Brendan. Good luck. Have a safe drive home. And uh, I hope that either through CarMax or Volkswagen, you get that covered under warranty. Okay, next one comes from Eric. He says, one question regarding failure of the Mark VI water pumps. Where does the leakage occur on which part of the unit? Thanks for your help, Eric. Um, Eric, I did a video on this water pump a while back. I'll put a link to the water pump failure video and the intake manifold failure video in the video notes for you guys to check out. Basically, the spot that it typically leaks is at the top of the pump in the center. And if you watch that video, I show really up close the exact point of leakage. Now, this pump can leak really from any point. It can leak where the two housings bolt together. It can leak at the bottom, it can leak at the top, it could leak at the ECT, but most commonly they do leak at the top in the middle. And typically, that comes from oil actually leaking down the front of the engine and saturating the housing with oil. They can also leak due to improper installation. If the pump wasn't seated on the pins properly or if it wasn't torqued properly, then that can lead to leakage and failure as well. But Eric, I highly recommend you watch that video and you can see exactly the points of failure on that water pump. All right, next one comes from Francis. He's got a question about DSG. Why is it important to service the DSG every 40,000 miles? Thanks. Um, awesome question, really. You know, sometimes we, we see these service intervals and we just kind of either follow them blindly or ignore them blindly, really. Um, we don't analyze exactly what the reason is for this interval and why that particular mileage is the one that was chosen. Now, my first thought is, is well, it's in the owner's manual, that's when you want to service it. We want to make sure we're taking good care of this DSG transmission. Any repair on that transmission is pretty expensive. Understanding the exact why is more of a guess from my standpoint than anything. 
I would assume that any type of contaminant that would get into this fluid over time, over wear, you know, this is basically a manual transmission. You are gonna get some wear of the gears. You're gonna get wear of the synchros. That fluid is gonna hold these contaminants. And by changing it, we hope to prevent any type of clogging or contaminants getting lodged in places where it's not supposed to be inside the mechatronic unit or inside the clutch pack. Speaking of the clutch pack, this vehicle also has a clutch pack very similar to an automatic transmission. The one that has the 40K interval is a wet clutch transmission. So there can be breakdown of those clutches as well. And we wanna make sure that we're getting that old fluid out, putting fresh clean fluid in to prevent any kind of damage or sticking valves or debris getting in places where we don't want it. And that's why we're changing the filter as well as the fluid. But awesome question, Francis. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send this over to the folks at C RP Automotive since they supply the DSG fluid for Volkswagen and Audi and see if I can get a little bit more in-depth answer for you on the fluid specifically. So uh, yeah, great question, Francis. And again, as soon as I get that answer back from them, I'll be sure to let you guys know. All right, next one comes from DR. He says, your YouTube videos are amazing. Unfortunately, I've had to watch a number of them for my 2010 GTI. The car has 40,000 miles and so far I've had to replace the intake manifold rear main crank seal, wheel bearings, turbo leaking oil into the cutoff valve, oil leaking in upper timing chain cover. This is my wife's car and she does not beat it up. Should I be ready for a continuation of repairs or is it time to just get a Honda? I worry I will soon be watching your timing chain tensioner and water pump video. I know you're busy, but any reply would be appreciated. Um, that's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of oil leaks, wheel bearing failure. You know, hopefully you don't have to worry about the timing chain tensioner, but you are in one of the earlier generation of the CCTA, so that may be a concern as well. The good thing or the bad thing is these are all somewhat common things on the GTI, on the CCTA engine, so it's not just limited to the GTI. This is kind of across the board with all the vehicles that have that 2.0T engine in it. Um, you know, with the oil leaks, we may be looking at a failure of the crank vent valve. I know whenever we replace a rear main seal or do any kind of oil leaks, we like to replace the crank vent valve. Usually it's squirrely crankcase pressure that starts to make these oil seals blow out, causing oil leaks. And then you fix one, and then the next weakest one leaks, and then the next weakest one leaks. So that may describe why you're seeing multiple oil leaks on your vehicle. You know, there's two ways to look at it. You can look at it as you've put a bunch of money into it or a bunch of time into it to fix these parts, and you're tired of doing that, and I totally understand, and it's time to get a different car. I wouldn't fault anybody at all for, for feeling that way. But we can look at it another way. You've put a bunch of parts on it. You've done a rear main seal. You've done an intake manifold. You've done wheel bearings. So you've got a lot of these really common things that fail on the GTIs already taken care of. The good thing about it is multiple failures on these particular parts are really uncommon. So I'd like to think you got like the bulk of everything taken care of and now you don't have to worry about that stuff anymore. We can just kind of go on with life, keep on driving and maybe only worry about maintenance parts or a different type of failure down the road. As far as whether to trade it or not, man, that's that's really up to you. Um, all I can do is tell you my input on it and one or two different ways to look at the issue. You can check the timing chain tensioner without too much disassembly. On the lower timing cover, there is a plug. You can remove the plug and with a mirror and flashlight, see into the tensioner and look and see whether it's the old style or one of the newer updated styles. While that may not tell you 100%, you're not gonna have a failure. The new style tensioners have been a lot more reliable than the old ones. So thanks for watching all the videos. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where I'm sorry that you've had to watch all of them. Uh, I'm just glad that there's at least a resource that is out there that helps you understand some of these failures and what some of these parts look like and how they're failing. All right, I think we got time for one more. This one comes from Dennis. It's about auto door locks. How do I turn off the auto door locks on my 2006 Jetta? I don't have deluxe feature buttons under the wiper controls like some, thanks. Um, you need to recode the convenience module to turn that off. There are some models that you can turn the auto lock off through the MFI. That's usually the higher line stuff. For your Jetta, you do need to have it either recoded or the adaptation changed. I forget on that one which one it is. This is a really good opportunity though for me to recommend buying Vagcom from Rostec. This is an awesome product. This product will let you do exactly what you want to do, as well as do things like pull engine codes and pull transmission codes. Uh, Rostec has an awesome, awesome, awesome wiki page, and I'll put a link to both the Vagcom and the wiki page down in the show notes. I highly recommend Vagcom. As a Volkswagen tech, I use Vagcom all the time. My cable I bought in, I think, 2005 or 2006, and I use it multiple times a week at the dealership on cars that aren't warranty cars. So check out Vagcom. I think for the limited VIN, it's like 250 bucks. It's well worth the money. 
Think of paying three diagnostic charges at a dealership. That's over $300 when you can do a lot of that stuff yourself. The Ross Tech Wiki page is great with a ton of really great resources in that. You can search by P code. You can search on their DIY stuff. So check them out, Ross dash tech.com and I'll put a link in the show notes so you can just head right over there. All right guys, I'm gonna wrap it up there. If you have any questions or comments, post it in the comments section below. Hey, if you like the video, throw it a thumbs up on YouTube. I always appreciate that. You can also subscribe on YouTube or on the blog at humblemechanic.com. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the blog, and obviously here on YouTube. All right guys, thanks for watching and I will see you next time. These are bent valves from a, uh, <laughs> A, a CCTA engine that the uh, timing chain tensioner failed. No, wait, it wasn't the timing chain tensioner failed. Oh, the bolt for the crank pulley came out and, uh, and bent like three quarters of the valve.